If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. And so today, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we're going to examine these four passages that serve as my background, Habakkuk 1, or Habakkuk 2, 4, Hebrews 10, 38, Romans 1, 16, 17, Galatians 3, 11, 12, all have one central theme, and that is, the just shall live by faith. It is apparent that the writer uh, to the Hebrews, the writer to the Romans, and the Galatians, uh, the writer to the Romans and the Galatians, the Apostle Paul, the writer to the Hebrews, in my world, it's Barnabas, but uh, they were very much aware of Habakkuk's discussion about faith. And when one reads that particular passage in the book of Habakkuk, what is God saying? God isn't saying it's the accumulation of stuff, nor the prosperity movement of, you know, witchcraft, so to speak, creating a prosperous environment, but in the economy of God, faith was supposed to be a lifestyle. A careful exegesis of Habakkuk tells us that what he is arguing about, <clears throat> what he is saying to God, is I don't understand the injustice in the government. How can people uh, uh, legislate laws that they can't keep themselves? So he's frustrated about it, and God answers him, not by giving him the reason these people are so unjust, but he says all you need is a renewed view of God. When you see God in control, then you don't worry about the people through whom he exercises the control. The person that you think that does not like you is not the real issue. It's you and God. And so when we understand that living by faith is a directive. How, do, how does the just live? By faith. How, let me rephrase. How does the just respond to life issues? By faith. How does the just live in their daily existence? By faith. In other words, you and I that are born again, adopted into the family of God, have many questions as our lives, our lives unfold, we are not certain as to how we even arrived at said point. Everything might be going crazy. I'm not happy. I'm maybe even mildly depressed. And one wonders, what must I do to escape this rat race called life? And so there are people who will say to you, oh, you need a, a hobby, or you need friends, or you need something else to do, further removing us from the comfort that is us. In other words, you ought to walk by faith to the point where you're comfortable with you. That means that you are transferring the control of your life from everybody else back into the hand of God. When you are comfortable with you, since you realize you didn't make yourself, then you are comfortable with God's use of you and his decisions towards you. There are many things that I do not like about me. I wish I were more communicative. I wish I were more outgoing. I wish I were more of a party animal. But I am an introvert. I am a person who creates a world and I build walls. I don't let you in easily. But when I let you in, you in. But God help you if you do anything to me when you get in there. Because if you're in my wall then nobody's going to see what I'll do to you. <laughs> David said, it was not my enemy that reproached me. He said, but it was the one who sat at table, looked in my face, shared my meal, and promised to help him take care of my heart. Well, I wish I were more communicative. I wish I had a heart 
that didn't break like it does. It takes me a long time to be offended, but once I get there, it's hard for me to get back. I don't drop relational breadcrumbs. When I look back, there's nothing to connect me with you anymore, and I'm done with you. It starts with a feeling. That feeling will progress into an emotion. That emotion will progress into a withdrawal. I will still perform my duties. I will still do those things that I've been accustomed to doing. But the difference is there'll be no emotional connection. It'll be a function. Is that how you want to live with God? Is that what you want to do? Treat him like, okay, God, I'm in church today. Do something for me. Or do you want to have a wholesome relationship that says, God, even when I'm going through, it's all right. Because I know who you are. I know what you're up to. And I refuse to live a life outside of faith. Are you with me? Well, then let's go on this slow evolutionary ride about stretching one's faith. These four references make uh, uh, the statement that the just live by faith. But again, is living by faith only about money and good times? Is it only about the accumulation of stuff? Is it, is it uh, living the American dream? I submit to you that people living in leper colonies in India and other third world, so-called third world countries are still exercising faith. And how does God honor their faith? By sending missionaries from other countries to bring the people the beloved word of God. And so I want you to understand what are we addressing? How do we work out our faith? How do we live out our faith? I call your attention to the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 6. What makes the Gospel of St. Luke so interesting? Jesus only has two listed genealogies in the Gospels. One in Matthew, one in Luke. You will notice when you read the genealogies that each one speaks to the character that the Gospel writer wants to present. In Matthew's Gospel, he wants to present Jesus as a king. So his genealogy starts with David. He wants to show you that Jesus is connected to regal bloodlines because it's important to him that the reader understands that Jesus is not some bum from the side of the road, even though being born in Nazareth, he still, or, or being born in Bethlehem rather, he still has that connection to greatness. It is Matthew's responsibility to present to us this king, and a king needs a what? Kingdom. So peppered throughout Matthew's gospel is a constant use of the word kingdom. He is careful to separate the kingdom of heaven from the kingdom of God. He is careful to have us understand that the kingdom of God is physical, but the kingdom of heaven is spiritual. That wherever the kingdom of God shows up, heaven is right there. Whenever the attributes of the kingdom of God are present, such as healing, deliverance, blessing, all of those things, then heaven is there with you. Heaven, Matthew presents, is more of a frame of mind than it is a literal place. So in other words, while I'm living on this earth, I'm in the kingdom of heaven. Ah, glory. So the other presentation comes from Luke. Now, Matt, Mark doesn't have a presentation of genealogy. Because Mark's gospel is Jesus is a servant. And nobody cares where a servant comes from. So they don't care about your lineage when you're a servant. They just talk about what he did. That's all Mark does. Talks about what he does, what Jesus did. And he's writing for Peter who, for some reason, has chosen to dictate this thing to Mark. And Mark ghostwrites it for Peter. But Luke is presenting Jesus as a man. It's important for you to understand that while Jesus is a king and he is a servant, 
He's also a man. And in the context of presenting Jesus as a man, Luke feels it necessary to list his genealogy. But Luke starts Jesus' genealogy with his stepfather, Joseph, and then runs it all the way back to Adam to show you that the man of God has come to live among us, coming from the lineage of the first man of God. Why is this necessary? I can understand that, the, that Matthew's gospel is reaching out to those Jews who feel that you don't have credibility unless you have a kingly position. I can understand Mark's gospel in presenting Jesus as a servant, and so Jesus constantly moves around doing great stuff. But Luke's gospel wants you to realize that while Jesus is a king, and while he does serve, he's a man. And this is critical because Jesus... When he gets to John's gospel, who presents him as God, who don't even fool with genealogies, who takes you back to the ultimate genealogy and says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was made flesh, that's it. He says, I ain't fooling with all those, was the son of, who was the son of, who was the son of. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and God made the word flesh. So he's telling you right away, Jesus is God. And for some reason... For some reason, the Johannian gospel stands apart from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And to that end, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptics. They were written, Mark's gospel was the first one written, and so that's why the other two are so connected and the miracles seem to work together. But when you get to the Johannian gospel, you find that it's pretty much isolated. And some of the stuff over in John's gospel isn't even mentioned in the other two. Only John gives us the seven I am's. Only John gives us the theological and grammatical link between the I am of Exodus 3 and the I am's of John's gospel. Only John wants you to know that God came and died for you in the person of God who linked with uh, Luke was a man. God became a man. What if God was one of us? If you believe God for a miracle and you know we can do the impossible, shout yeah. Yes, I believe God for a miracle. And if you trust that he'll do what he said he would, in the end it will work out for your good, shout yeah. Thing that you need. 